America's got a secret. Nestled in the northwest corner of the state of Wyoming, hidden under blue skies, rolling rivers, and one of the most famous national parks in the world, a subterranean vault holds the sort of cargoes that could end the entire world as we know it. But unlike many of America's secrets, this one requires no security clearance, it requires no special badge, no confidence of the president's, no James Bond style super skills. It's not nukes, it certainly isn't lizard people, and it isn't aliens. Well, maybe it's aliens, but that's not the point of today's video. The secret is the Yellowstone supervolcano, a series of massive underground calderas full of hundreds of cubic kilometers of molten rock hidden close enough to the Earth's surface that its heat keeps Yellowstone National Park's geothermal vents active 365 days a year. It's erupted before, and there's very little doubt that it'll someday erupt again with enough cataclysmic force to plunge the entire world into a forced winter. So, what would an eruption at Yellowstone be like? What are the chances that it might happen again in our lifetimes? And if it did, well, what would that mean for all of us? Well, in today's installment of Places, we're going to endeavor to answer that question and more. A tribute to a deadly supervolcano that could end life as we know it. Now, Yellowstone is one of those places you've just got to visit once in your life. I've never been, but I certainly would like to go. For the low price of $35, you can take your car in and everything and spend seven days in America's oldest national park. Sprawled out across 2.2 million gorgeous acres of land, Yellowstone's mountains, its geezers, its bears and wolves and bison are among the most immaculately preserved landscapes in the world. And even despite choking knots of tourists in its busiest parts, the park is one location that should be on every viewer's bucket list. And even beyond Yellowstone's incredible ecosystem, it stands out for another reason. It's geology. Everything at the park, directly or indirectly, can trace its energy source to the supervolcano that lies beneath. Its heat is substantial enough that it warms hot springs and forces steam out of underground pools in the form of geysers, while the volcanic byproducts in the soil dictate which plants can take root and where. Even the park's fungi, an all but invisible part of its natural order, thrive on the heat emanating upward from the caldera below, and incredible bacteria growths like those at the Grand Prismatic Spring would be impossible without the forces of the planet seething beneath it. Those forces are those of a supervolcano. Now, on one hand, it might be tempted to think of a supervolcano as, well, just a really, really big volcano, and that's not technically incorrect. Supervolcanoes are indeed the most massive volcanoes out there. But just thinking of them as big volcanoes somewhat undersells the sheer size and scale of what we're talking about here. In order to qualify for supervolcano status, a volcano has got to have at least one eruption in its lifetime where at least a thousand cubic kilometers or 240 cubic miles of lava, ash, and other materials were spewed out. Now, just for comparison's sake, so we can make a little bit of sense of that number, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens released under 3 cubic kilometers of material, or 0.67 cubic miles, weighing 540 million tons of perspective, that eruption turned hundreds of square miles in the surrounding region into a wasteland and killed 57 people and thousands of animals. So, with the minimum threshold being an eruption well over a thousand times that size, it's kind of difficult still to comprehend the sheer size of a supervolcano eruption. Yellowstone's largest eruption, its first expelled 2,450 cubic kilometers of material, and multiple other supervolcanoes, including Toba in Indonesia and Taupo in New Zealand, are known to have erupted in the years after the first prehistoric humans came to be. The caldera beneath Yellowstone is ancient by any human standards, but in the grand scale of planet Earth, volcanic activity there might as well have happened yesterday. The major eruptions we know a fair amount about took place starting 2.1 million years ago, then again about 1.3 million years ago, and a third at about 640,000 years ago. And the second of those three eruptions wasn't even big enough to be classified as supervolcanic. In fact, it's had plenty of small eruptions, ones that mimic what we would expect from any smaller volcano due to the inconsistent ways that magma rises toward the surface. But the area is nonetheless constantly roiling beneath the surface, so much so that the location of its eruptions has moved east-northeast for millions of years. 
In an odd geological illusion, the underground caldera hasn't actually moved at all, but rather the crust of the Earth, specifically the North American plate, moves west southwest quickly enough that the supervolcano's last few eruptions have formed the entire eastern section of the Snake River Plain. In fact, evidence of a caldera as many as 70 million years ago in Canada's Yukon Territory are believed to be from the same caldera that now sits underneath Yellowstone. Simply put, tectonic plates, pretty wild. As far as how supervolcanoes work, the best way to explain it is through something of a nasty analogy. Let's say that a volcano is represented by a pimple on your face. It's got all that gross stuff under the skin, and it raises into a little white head close enough to the surface that it can be seen, but still held back just a little bit. In similar fashion, volcanoes occur when magma from the Earth's mantle, a layer of its interior made up of molten rock, rises into the Earth's outermost layer, its crust, but isn't yet ready to break through. Much like that stubborn pimple on your chin, more and more magma pools closer to the surface, so much so that in the days immediately preceding volcanic eruptions, the ground itself can swell and morph under the strain coming from below. Eventually, just like you popping that pimple, the seal breaks, except in this case, the nasty shit pouring out is not pimple juice, it is lava. Supervolcanoes operate in roughly the same way, but obviously on a larger scale. So large, in fact, that after magma pools and erupts, it leaves behind a massive underground cauldron that slowly refills with molten and congealed magma. Yellowstone, in particular, has had at least four calderas, which should give an idea of just how much ejector it can produce. And if you remember back to when we said that the much, much smaller eruption of Mount St. Helens expelled 240 million tons of material into the atmosphere, then it should give some context to the hundreds of billions of tons that might be coughed out by a supervolcano. Launched with enough heat and force that it can climb all the way to the stratosphere, the ash of a supervolcano eruption is more than capable of swirling its way all around the planet, and once it arrives up there, it's going to take a really, really long time to go away. With skies so washed with ash that the sun is blotted out in every part of the world, a supervolcano eruption can trigger a mini ice age, wipe out hundreds or thousands of species, and threaten any and all forms of life that interact with the world's surface. Now, the nice thing about supervolcanoes like this is that they erupt very rarely. According to modern estimates, the chances that Yellowstone will erupt during our lifetimes is very slim, about 1 in 10,000, and the other handful of supervolcanoes around the world erupt just as infrequently, if not more so. Calderas take a really long time to fill, seeing as it's done by squeezing almost totally solid rock, as if it was being moved through a toothpaste tube, and they don't fill at constant rates, depleting just as often as they fill. Iceland is regarded by some scientists to be a supervolcano in the process of forming, and things there seem to be going just fine. So too with the Siberian Traps, the Andes Volcanic Zone, and even the modern-day Lake Toba, whose supervolcano erupted just 75,000 years ago. Suffice to say that we and our children and our children's children probably won't live any major portion of their lives in a volcanic winter. But that hasn't stopped global geologists, analysts, and journalists from asking the critical question anyway. What if Yellowstone did erupt, and what if we had to live through what comes next? Now, if Yellowstone were to erupt tomorrow, it would immediately move to the very top of earthly explosions that humanity has ever witnessed. At its size, a full supervolcanic eruption at Yellowstone would produce an energy output equivalent to that of a thousand Hiroshima bombs. Not in total, not per day, not per hour but a thousand per second. In the earliest moments of an eruption, this would lead to two incredibly dangerous consequences, the earthquake and the shockwave. It's hard to say just how massive an earthquake a Yellowstone eruption would produce, but suffice to say that it would be on the level of the biggest and most devastating earthquakes of human history if not even larger. The largest earthquake ever, a magnitude 9.5 that took place in Chile in 1960, took place in a relatively remote part of the world, but even still it led to an adjusted $8 billion of damage and killed some 6,000 people, as well as triggering landslides and global tsunamis and completely devastating nearby population centers. Yellowstone's far from the sea and relatively remote, but an earthquake there of a similar magnitude would likely bring cities like Jackson, Bozeman, Billings, and Idaho Falls to their knees. And if the earthquakes didn't, the shockwave likely would. Now, in order to understand the impact of this shockwave, 
let's go through the severity of a small nuclear bomb, specifically the one dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. In that blast, a person located three full kilometers away from the blast would have been hit by a shockwave so powerful that it would have been followed by hurricane force winds, while the heat from the blast would have also set their skin and clothes on fire. And remember, Yellowstone gives off a thousand times that massive energy explosion every single second. In total, that shockwave is estimated to have the potential to kill some 90,000 people just by itself. And then there's the part where things get really bad. The supervolcano's pyroclastic flows. Basically hot, dense clouds of ash, these flows move outward from a volcano in all directions. But first, let's discuss how it moves close to the ground. Although pyroclastic flow from Yellowstone likely wouldn't travel faster than 80 kilometers an hour or so, meaning that someone could outrun it in their car, any person caught inside would be scalded, suffocated, and basically get run over by a truck all at the same time, with these flows probably traveling for many miles in every direction. And even worse, the flows that go upward into the atmosphere. As described in a 2014 paper by scientists Larry Mastin, Alexa Von Eaton, and Jacob Lauston, the ash produced by a Yellowstone eruption would all but bury the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming in upwards of 100 millimeters or three feet of ash, turning all of that land and everyone in it into a modern day version of Pompeii. Another layer, between 30 and 100 millimeters thick, would cover about half the landmass of Washington, Oregon, South Dakota, Colorado, and Utah, and swallow up almost the entire state of Nevada. Dense enough to kill plants and animals, crush buildings, and destroy infrastructure. Moving outward from there, 10 to 30 millimeters of ash would swallow up most of California and the American Midwest, blanketing cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, and St. Louis, while wiping out the most important agricultural centers across the country. At least three millimeters of ash would reach as far as Washington, D.C., and lower levels of ashfall would spare no part of the country except for Miami, the Florida Everglades, and the southernmost tip of Texas. And lastly, there's the most devastating effect of an eruption at Yellowstone, and no, we haven't got there yet, and that would be its ash plume, which would be launched miles upon miles into the air before being swirled around in dense coverage of the entire planet. An ash cloud around the Earth would have devastating consequences, sending temperatures plummeting worldwide, dramatically reducing or even eliminating crop yields, and sending air quality into the toilet. Although the cloud would first hang in an umbrella over the continental US and southern Canada, it would eventually start to sweep eastward, past the American eastern seaboard, towards Europe and Africa. And from there, it would fall in a shroud over the entire northern hemisphere, and with a couple of years to work its own balance out, it would eventually encircle the entire planet. During the eruption of the Toba supervolcano some 74,000 years ago, a volcanic winter is believed to have lasted north of five years and possibly as long as ten, coming close to wiping out the entire prehistoric human race in the process. What that same eruption would do to the world today is hard to even fathom. It's important to note here that there is no indication that any species has ever been wiped out completely due to a supervolcano. But then again, no modern scientists have yet had the opportunity to keep track. At Yellowstone itself, the eruption will likely continue for a period of weeks or months, pumping volcanic ash, gas, magma, and other debris into the sky long after the world is already caked in soot. When it finally runs out, and there's no more matter for the supervolcano to cough up, It'll collapse in on itself, with the entire landscape that we know today as Yellowstone National Park being swallowed up into a new crater. In the following millennia, after that crater settles down, it'll be overtaken by new growth, new vegetation, and new animals, eventually becoming its own unique landscape. But for the rest of the lifetimes of those who survive the blast, it'll hardly be anything at all, except the dried up innards of the Earth left on display in the aftermath. And there's one other complicating factor to consider here, which is that when Yellowstone has erupted before, it hasn't always gone off with one blast. Geological evidence suggests that in its most recent eruption, Yellowstone pulsed in at least four different places, with enough time between eruptions that geologists have found that layers of rock produced by one of the pulses was able to cool completely before another pulse covered it in a subsequent layer. Whether the gap in question was a few weeks or a few years is totally unknown, suggesting that there's a possibility that once Yellowstone does start erupting, it operates a bit more like a chimney than a spraying geyser. In that world, an ash cloud forming above the surface of the planet may not go away nearly as quickly as humanity would hope, with more and more of the stuff puffing into the atmosphere at unpredictable intervals until the eruption finally concludes. With a volcanic winter that already would threaten mass die-offs for many species, such an extended length of impact could be even more catastrophic. Now, with stakes like that, it should be no surprise that the main question on the minds of many global onlookers is, well, when is Yellowstone going to erupt again? 
The easiest way to find an answer is to average the interval between Yellowstone's three known prior eruptions and then project those numbers forward. On average, the supervolcano is believed to have erupted at roughly 730,000 year intervals, giving it a roughly 0.00014% chance of erupting in any given year. But that number, when compared to the supervolcano's last eruption about 664,000 years ago, has led to casual observers to start to ask a second question. Are we overdue for another explosion? As any geologist working with Yellowstone will probably tell you, the level of Yellowstone supervolcano-related hysteria is never quite at zero. But it reached a fever pitch in 2013, after a study on the Yellowstone magma chamber revealed that the magma body was larger than previously thought. Now, this wasn't urgent news at all, not even a little bit, but a simple fact like this is, of course, powerless to stand in the way of a good story. That's easiest if we just share some of the big headlines of that time brought to us by National Parks Traveler. There's a volcano under Yellowstone that could destroy us all. Yes, that's correct, but it's been there a while. Yellowstone supervolcano alert! The most dangerous volcano in America is roaring to life. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. And finally, Yellowstone, the supervolcano that could blow up America. Which, yes, quite a few hypothetical natural disasters could also do, even if there's absolutely zero indication that they could do it anytime soon. And so, Yellowstone panic swept the nation, and ever since then, there's a certain proportion of Americans who just need a little bit of prodding to get them to explain how they've got a bunker full of canned beans ready in case the world ends. But we've also got to add a little bit of context here. Firstly, Yellowstone was not, in fact, about to blow, and the fact that his magma body was larger than previously believed, the proportion that was believed to be melted, stayed the same at a very low 10-15%. to 15%. As unhappy as it might be to have to sit in a caldera, solid rock really doesn't tend to go anywhere in the the liquid magma that does exist isn't just sitting in the middle of a big open pit. The Yellowstone caldera, like any other caldera, is made up of porous, sponge-like rock in between solid rock, and in those porous parts liquid magma may exist, but a supervolcano caldera is not an underground cave. And even if it was, it was nowhere close to full with the molten rock that might actually erupt. And then we want to address all of this overdue nonsense, because while it's all well and good to take an average of the intervals between eruptions, as we did before, that number doesn't actually mean anything. With a sample size of just three eruptions and only two intervals, a simple average between them should give quite literally zero confidence to a potential next eruption date. Volcanoes don't have clocks, they don't have schedules, and they don't fill in erupts on any sort of regular timeline. Yellowstone is no different, and while it's certainly possible that it could erupt in any given year, that likelihood doesn't change simply because there have been more years before it when it didn't erupt. Magma flows in and out of the Yellowstone caldera. It doesn't simply drip into a bucket for 730,000 years until it's full. So rather than spending any meaningful length of time fretting about being overdue, we here at Places recommend just taking it day by day. It's also important to understand that a massive explosive world-changing eruption is not the only way that the Yellowstone caldera can relieve its internal pressure. Hydrothermal eruptions, that is to say, those involving steam and hot water, are much more likely, taking place on a far smaller scale with far less ability to have a major impact. Alternately, the area can develop lava flows, which, despite being magma erupting through to the Earth's surface, would not pose anywhere near the global risk that a true supervolcanic eruption would. At worst, a flow might travel toward a few bison and tourists, who would hopefully have the good sense to get out of the way rather than snapping pictures. But after a day or two of front-page headlines, that sort of volcanic incident could be contained quite simply, allowing the supervolcano to blow off some steam while not going full Thanos on us. However, we can't exactly tell you to let your guard all the way down, because even with no known threat of an imminent eruption, Yellowstone does tend to move. Between the years of 2004 and 2009, volcanologists at the park observed observed the ground rising a total of 9.8 inches, or 25 centimeters, due to magma feeding into the caldera. In 2010, that effect started to back off a little bit, and the park has since begun to lower. While this is not necessarily a sign of impending doom, it does indicate that the caldera still experiences the active flow of magma in and out at a non-constant rate. That means the chamber can conceivably fill to the point of bursting again. The park also experiences anywhere between 1 and 3,000 earthquakes a year, several on an average day, and on occasion it experiences an earthquake swarm, where shakes occur at a much higher rate. In September of 2022, for example, the park experienced north of 500 earthquakes as part of a swarm originating from a point near Grizzly Lake, plus another 238 in the following month. For the more neurotic among our viewers, we do understand that this probably isn't great news. Shaking, swelling grounds underneath Yellowstone may not be the end of the world, but it's certainly not a sign that it will be well forever. 
If there's anything reassuring about it, though, is that we can say with a fair bit of certainty that there will be specific warnings in advance of an eruption at Yellowstone. More than likely, the first indicators will be with another groundswell, either much longer or much more sharply than that observed in the 2000s. As the ground rises, earthquake swarms will begin and then increase in their regularity and magnitude. Given the geothermal activity already observed at Yellowstone on an average day, another indicator of a coming eruption will probably be more frequent or more forceful events, sharper or larger geyser bursts, or bursts in new places, or steam rising up from points in the grounds that really should not be steaming. See any of those signs? And sure, Yellowstone might be edging a bit closer to the edge. But until and unless that happens, there's probably nothing to worry about. And with such public awareness of the supervolcano lurking underneath the park, you can rest assured that volcanologists the world over would sound the alarm as soon as those signs emerged. And finally, there's the possibility that Yellowstone is simply finished erupting. In today's world, a great many mountains were once active volcanoes, but have now gone extinct with no real possibility that they'll ever erupt again. And the presence of magma flow underground doesn't necessarily indicate that an eruption would ever happen, even in such a geological hotbed like Yellowstone. To put it simply, there's a reasonable chance that this long-awaited next eruption will never happen. So perhaps that's the best note to end on today, is that even though an eruption at Yellowstone would be absolutely devastating, even though it would lead to volcanic winter and change the world as we know it, that simply isn't a likely thing you're ever going to have to live through. Out of all the likely possibilities, the most likely by far is that any curiosity we have about what it would be like to live through a Yellowstone eruption will remain unsatisfied until and even beyond our deaths. Given the alternative, well, that actually sounds pretty good to us. Thanks for watching.